Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. Turmoil in the banking system, really starting in the US and now in Europe, has got lots of people concerned about the safety of their deposits. There have been comments out of Singapore asking, you know, is there exposure to the US? So a lot of the world is wondering about the safety of banks. And as a result, people have been asking me, well, you know, what's gonna happen if my money's here, there, or somewhere else? Because Silicon Valley Bank went down, okay, it was able to be backstopped by FDIC and they decided to secure everybody's deposits. That's great, but would that be true in some of these other countries? And so today I'm gonna to discuss the answer to that question, or at least kind of a framework for thinking about that. I think frameworks are important, so you can analyze where you might have holes in your thinking, et cetera, and share with you some things that may not be the nicest to hear, but uh, hopefully will help you to protect yourself and your money. So. Uh, let's dive in and discuss that now. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notification bell. Thank you for being here with us. If you would like help with the fields that we deal with, which are international tax optimization, international banking, and moving up moving and doing business abroad, then please reach out to us. You can book a call with me, calendly.com forward slash Michael Dash Rosworth. There's a link in the description below, or send a message through offshorecitizen.net. So I've banked all over the world and helped clients from, I guess we have clients from 62 countries now, uh, bank in many different parts of the world and struggled with the annoyance that is international banking today. And therefore, we're gonna talk about it from that perspective because I think a lot about these problems since they're a big part of what we design for clients. We can design you know, the best tax structure in the world, best corporate structure, et cetera, but if you don't have good banking, it all goes to hell. So we actually often, when we're designing structures, think specifically about banking as like one of the first points and then reverse engineer into many others. So how is it that banks fail and how is it that you get bank safety? Okay, this is the kind of most important question. I've talked in some other videos about how there is risks like they could be cut off from the US financial system, they could lose their correspondent banking license, they could get called out as a money laundering risk or something like that. We're not gonna discuss those things today, I've discussed them in previous videos. Today we're gonna talk about the like structural stability and safety of your money in a bank, okay? It's worth understanding that essentially when you deposit your money into a bank, typically the bank's risk and your risk commingle. That's kind of the nature of a banking relationship. Now, this is not true of EMIs. If you're talking about electronic money institutions, EMIs, then you're talking about an institution where they actually themselves do not hold your deposits. They're not a deposit-taking institution. Your money will be with the sponsoring bank. They have typically something called a Nostro account at those banks. And so the money is held there, and they're basically providing a layer of software. I've done a video uh, about this uh, in the past. So you're typically not exposed. And there was a recent example, I think it was the bank Nuri. Uh, they'd, I forget what they'd been called before. Something to do with uh, crypto, Bitwala or something like that became Nuri and they ended up going under. And if you were exposed to them, the actual financial institution that provided the banking services sent out messages to everybody and said, hey, don't worry about it. Your money's safe, we're all good. That, uh, that basically software company on top of it was not. And there's different types of licenses that institutions can get. For example, they can get lending licenses, they can get uh, deposit taking licenses. Deposit taking licenses are typically one of the higher uh, end ones and so that's not very common and they're highly regulated and supervised in most jurisdictions. Okay, So those are the, that's kind of the foundational basic part. So what happens is the bank is going to have a bunch of assets and they're going to have a bunch of liabilities. Okay, Now the liabilities are principally going to be deposits. So in other words, the amount of money that they owe is gonna be whatever the debts they have to everybody else plus the debts they have to depositors. So when you put money into the bank, uh, you become a creditor uh, to the bank, right? You're, you're one where they owe you money, right? So they have to record that. At the same time, the money that they give you becomes an asset on their balance sheet, and they're gonna take that and they're typically, not always, but typically gonna go lend it out and they're gonna try and earn some yield on it in one form or another. They may put it into uh, some sort of bonds, as is pretty common, or they may go and do some sort of mortgages with it or some other sorts of loans. And there are statutory requirements that vary a little bit country by country, but broadly are defined by something called Basel III. And these lay down the amount of capital the bank needs to have and reserves. Okay, so reserves are essentially like liquid cash that you have to have so that you can honor uh, incoming and outgoing transactions. Capital is the equity 
that the bank has, basically shareholder equity. So uh, the amount of money that they've put in plus retained earnings that is held and that there's no, uh, no liabilities uh, going against that essentially. Okay, so they need to keep a certain ratio of capital and actually banks in terms of their lending are capital constrained, not reserves constrained. So somebody was making a comment on Twitter about the subject of they said oh you know well why can't the bank just lend money in order to create deposits in order to have the deposits to turn around and lend them out and the reality is it's because the banks are capital constrained rather than reserves constrained banks in a lot of cases have no reserve limitations to lending they have capital restraints on lending okay so kind of a different concept there that people don't really understand so anyway the bank has a whole bunch of assets and the risk is that the assets of the bank fall below the liabilities, okay? And so we can ask, well, how can that happen? And there's really uh, two main ways, and one of those breaks off into two. So the first is the bank is simply losing money. It's not profitable. So the amount of profit that is charged through their operations is less than the amount, or I guess it would be the revenue that's coming in, is less than their expenses. Okay, maybe they're running inefficiently, they can't attract enough customers, whatever the situation may be, for some reason they are losing money. A bank that is losing money is an unsafe bank, okay? Because if you keep going down that road long enough, eventually they're gonna eat through those assets and be in a situation where there's a risk to the depositors. Again, there's you know oversight and there's regulations and things like this to try and limit the point at which that becomes risky, but the point is at some point it could happen. So. Profitability is the first most important thing for a bank, okay? Bank that's not profitable long-term goes out of business, which puts you at inconvenience if not at risk. The other thing that can happen is that they could end up in a situation where they actually are profitable and they are solvent, right? Meaning that the amount of assets are actually worth more than the amount of uh, liabilities, but for some reason the value of the assets crashes. And there are basically two paths under which the value of those assets would crash. The first is if it turns out that the loans that were paid were bad. So this is essentially the 2008 situation. The banks on paper leading into 2008 were solvent. You know, you have a mortgage backing the deposits, no big deal. It's quite safe, right? Well, that's true until you start to get a lot of foreclosures. And you know, they can generally tolerate a certain amount of foreclosures. There's actually something called the camel's test. Uh, which is a series of uh, seven, uh, six or seven metrics that they look at to evaluate the safety of banks. And so you could go through and it looks, looks all fine, but when it turns out you have mass scale collapse of the housing market, then lots more people end up uh, defaulting on their mortgages than you were expecting. And again, normally there's a margin of safety on those mortgages. So they can take the property and they can turn around, they can sell it and they can recoup the money and they're okay. But the property prices are also crashing so that it's destroying that margin of safety. Okay, So that is essentially uh, the one path by which the asset value could drop below the liabilities value for the bank. Okay. Now, the other thing that could happen is that you have essentially a run on the bank where a large amount of money is withdrawn very quickly. So for example, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, in addition to the fact that they'd had uh, deposits eaten down fairly quickly over about the last year, mainly because they had a lot of startups there. And those startups were typically getting funded a lot from VC funding. VC funding dried up. So these companies were continuing to spend, but they were in a situation where although they were continuing to spend, there was no new funding coming in. And therefore that was just eating up the deposits at the bank. Okay, so the, the deposit volume was going down. And if you have long-term holdings on the asset side, you know, trying to rebalance that can be a challenge. Okay, so that was accentuated by the fact that people got concerned and withdrew $42 billion out of a total of around, I think it was $170 billion of deposits. So, you know, about one quarter of all the deposits in the bank were withdrawn in a very short period of time. What happens when this is the case? Well, remember, we talked about how there are reserves and those reserves happen to be the liquid cash available. So they pay all that out as people are coming in and saying, hey, I want my money wired out to here. They're sending money, sending money, sending money. At some point, that tank starts to run dry and now they have long-term assets they need to dig into. Those long-term assets, again, let's just say it's a mortgage for a simple example. So I've gone, you wanted to buy a house for $500,000, you put down 20%, you borrowed 
$400,000 for it, great, that $400,000 loan that you owe to the bank all of a sudden becomes an asset on the bank's balance sheet. And, you know, assuming that you don't default, etc., it could be validly worth the 400000 with whatever interest rate. But if you have to sell it tomorrow, maybe not. So they have such quick need for cash that they have to fire sale things. And you know, if you try and sell anything really quickly, like say you have a house, you can sell any house tomorrow, just like that in most markets. But at what price, right? There's some price that you're able to liquidate it. The problem is that price drops. So banks typically don't have a massive gap in percentage terms between their assets and their liabilities. We'll use Silicon Valley Bank as the example. In their case, they had, I think it was 208 billion of assets and 200 or 195 billion of liabilities. Okay, not all deposits. There was, I think, 22 billion uh, were other liabilities and the rest was, so about 170 billion in deposits. Well, you know, so you have a $13 billion cushion, right? That's basically the cushion on your assets. Okay, maybe there's some goodwill, some franchise value if you were to sell the company, et cetera, but you can't keep operating based on that. And so, if they have, you're thinking about on $200 billion, that's a 5% margin of safety, right? 5% is not very big. You could easily be in a situation where you lose 5% of value. In fact, just interest rate fluctuations can cause bonds to drop by way over 5% in not too long a period of time. So the thing that we want to be really aware of is these are the two risks the banks can have. Right? Number one, they can be not profitable. Number two, they can be profitable, but their asset base can get eaten down. And that can happen either because the loans are bad, so the environment is overheated, they're making bad loans, etc., or because of the fact that deposits are pulled out too quickly and they're forced to fire sale assets. Those are the cases that you're typically going to experience bank risk. Where does this leave us? Well, clearly, some places are you know, more stable, better regulated, etc., than others. So, for example, Canada in 2008, had um, better stress tests, less kind of, let's call it cowboy lending out there. I mean, if you've seen the movie The Big Short, great movie, highly recommended. It's like people were getting mortgages for their dogs. There was these subprime mortgages, there was cashback mortgages, right? Not only were you able to get the money from the mortgage, you were able to get extra money on top of that. So very, very uh, reckless lending system. So when you start to see that, you can start to think, hmm, this is probably a bad environment for these banks. If I was to compare it to say someplace like Dubai, most of the loans are maybe 70% loan to value. So you have a 30% margin of safety is pretty significant. Yeah, you can get a little bit lower in some cases, but uh, not a massive amount. It's also not a very highly debt ridden society, at least not in that regard. There's off plan sales, but that's a whole other conversation. We're in a situation where you don't want to be in a place where it's like cowboy lending, asset prices going up really quickly, et cetera. Obviously, you're not going to dive deep into the financials of most banks and for most people's case. And frankly, it's really hard to get the information. It's not that transparent to figure out what's going on. But it is worth realizing that, you know, this could be, uh, could be bad if that's the conditions that you're in. So then we say, well, if there's a problem, what kind of protections are there now? In a case like the US, you have the Fed, right? So they're like lender of last resort. So the ability to supply liquidity is pretty high. I've actually, people focus on FDIC and they talk a lot about insurance protection and you know, is it 100,000 here, or 250,000 there, et cetera. I generally think that if you're worried about the insurance coming through, you probably have bigger problems. You wanna be in a situation where you don't have those problems because A, things are safe and B, you have other backups which is more or less what we saw here. Even people who were like 97% of deposits in uh, Silicon Valley Bank were not FDIC insured, and yet they chose to back them all. So that's good, right? That's a very good situation for you in terms of the safety of your deposits. So where does this leave us? Well, where this leaves us is you need a broader banking ecosystem that A, cares to bail these banks out. So this is one of the reasons I've said frequently, you know, going to Cayman Islands or Belize or, you know, uh, Cook Islands or St. Vincent or something is generally not that safe. It's because nobody significant who has the ability to do anything about it really cares about those banks. Whereas if Bank of America is going down, the senators are banking at Bank of America. 
there is not a chance in the world they will not vote to bail that bank out. Not a chance in the world. Are they gonna let themselves, their friends, their family, their kids, et cetera, lose their deposits? Not when they have a printing press. Will not do it. So the incentive is to print money and they have an unlimited ability to print money. Now granted, there's consequences of that unlimited ability to print money, but at least you get your dollars back, right? So that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. But even with, aside from that, what you have is you have a broader bank ecosystem where often other banks will come in and buy them up. So for example, if we look at Washington Mutual, which collapsed in 2008, it was, I think, the sixth largest bank in the US at the time, and they were bought by J.P. Morgan Chase, right? So J.P. Morgan came in and bought them up, and that was one of the things that kind of helped to uh, make things better for the depositors. Depositors didn't lose money in the case of Washington Mutual, which was positive, right? Better, better not to lose money. Now, where does this bring us? This brings us to a place where we say, okay, well, do they have the interest? Do they have the capacity to backstop these banks? And in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. For example, in the case of Iceland, they basically said, okay, we're gonna let the foreign people go down and we're gonna protect locally. That's, that's gonna be our move. We can't afford to bail everybody out. So it's just the size of our economy that here's what we're gonna do. So there is something to be said for having a larger economy with greater capability to bail themselves out. But there's the next part, which is they need the autonomy to be able to do so. So if you look at what happened in Cyprus and Greece back in 20, what was it, 2013, when Cyprus uh, had a situation that they took a haircut for all the depositors over 100,000 euros. Well, in that case, part of the problem was they were on the euro and they had no ability to print their own money. Okay, they had to go to the ECB. The ECB said, no, we're not bailing you out. And therefore, the depositors lose money. So you want a situation where the government can print, or the central bank uh, locally can print their own money. Okay, otherwise they're reliant on an external force. And that's partially this influence thing. So, you know, Cyprus was not significant enough. It had been Germany, probably they would have printed the money, right? Probably they would have said, whoa, it's Germany, we're the ECB, we're gonna bail them out. So very, very important to realize this connection. This brings up another really important point, which is they can only do this in their own currency, okay? So generally speaking, you are safer banking in the local currency than in the foreign currency. Now, there may be consequences of this. I'm gonna use uh, UAE as an example. So the dirham is pegged to the dollar, okay? So what would happen if a bank in UAE uh, went under? All of a sudden, you know, our depositors gonna lose money? We, we can't know, right? It's, it's uncertain. But conceivably, they would probably do a few different things. First of all, they would probably have another local bank come in to buy up the assets and shore the bank up. That'd probably be the first thing that would happen. Number two, they probably would have some sort of attempted protections in place to, uh, to backstop it, at least to some extent. In fact, the, the government may come in and take it over and you know, do something where they uh, basically wipe out the equity holders, the bond holders, et cetera, take that wealth for themselves, et cetera. Who knows how exactly that would work, but something along those lines. Uh, but the third thing they could do is they could say, all right, we're just going to wait it out. If you have this short-term liquidity crunch because of the fact that there's lots of depositors, we're just gonna tell people, okay, you can't withdraw your money right now. You're gonna have to wait. And they could wait it out that way. Is that pleasant? No, it's not pleasant. It's disruptive. Much better to have multiple accounts in multiple countries. But this being said, uh, that would be one tool that would be at their disposal to try and help to equalize things. And this sort of thing has happened in the past. If you look at when Caledonian Bank was shut down in Cayman Islands, this was around 2014, 2015, somewhere around then. Uh, in that situation, what you found was that uh, people got their money back, but they had a long wait. Similar thing when Banca Privada in Andorra. Uh, in that case, it wasn't that the bank went down, but they were named as a primary money laundering concern. And what happened? Uh, people got their money back, but they had to wait a bunch of time. When FBME went through the same thing in Cyprus, same deal. When these Cyprus banks, uh, in general, were having issues, you know, there was limitations on uh, money getting out. So those are all scenarios that could happen to a bank and you should be prepared for those. Ideally, you would want to be in a situation where you don't have to be. And that comes to this important point. Usually you're safer to bank in the local currency that they have the power to print. 
So if we look at UAE, they can print the dirham. They can make an unlimited amount of the dirham. Again, there's consequences of that. They may lose the peg with the dollar, but they're going to be in a situation where they can print that money. They can't print dollars. If you have a bank and it's in a bank account in Singapore, you have money in Singapore dollars, they can print Singapore dollars. They can cover you off there. If your deposits are in euros, they can't print euros. So, you know, the ability to make things right for you if you're in a foreign currency are not as good as if you're in a situation where you have the local currency. So you should consider possibly, and there's trade-offs to this I know, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world, and you know, so you can kind of choose to spread out your risk, but uh, you should consider having at least a portion of the money in that country, if, you're, if this is your concern, in the local currency that they can defend. Keeping in mind, there is other risks you're gonna have, aside from currency fluctuations, et cetera, you could lose the peg. For example, in Hong Kong, they could lose the peg with the dollar and maybe in a situation where the value of the money goes down. So you kind of have some uh, two different risks that you have to look at in this condition. Bottom line, number one, we want to pick institutions that are profitable. Number two, that have a large uh, balance sheet uh, ratio between like a strong balance sheet, right, where there's a strong ratio of assets to liabilities that you can typically find out from publicly available financial statements, so that's good. Uh, number three, ideally we'd want to not be in a really reckless uh, lending environment where it's more likely to be risky in kind of the, the post time after that. Number four, we want to be at a bank that is significant enough, in a country that is significant enough that people will care if things go down. If you have just a really small bank in a small country, people don't care. We want one where people care, so there's self-interest to take action to protect it. Number five, we want to be in a situation where the country actually has the ability to print money, okay? It might seem to some people like that's a bad thing in certain cases. I can't actually think of a case where it's a bad thing. Generally speaking, it's a good thing when they have that capability. They usually will abuse it, but that being said, it's good that they can. And finally, it can be helpful to be in a situation where you have the local currency held because it's more likely, not assured, but more likely that they can and will defend those reserves. And we have some historical precedents where they would do that. So I hope that helps you, gives you kind of six principles to look at when thinking about bank safety. I think it's absolutely smart to spread your money between multiple institutions in the same country and multiple countries because they have different risks that will cluster. And at least then you're in a situation where you have some flexibility, maybe things go bad in one place it's much, much less likely that they will go bad in both places or three places or four places all at the same time. If you're in four or five non-correlated places, it's extremely unlikely they're all going to go down. It could, and so that's a whole subject for another video you can go and check out about asset protection and kind of defending yourself. I'll talk more about it in some other videos, but this would be from a banking standpoint. I hope that helps. If you have questions, put them in the comments below, and I'll look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.